I'm a designer, artist. I don't often make huge distinctions. I'm often employed as an artist. Um, I run this design, design and art studio in Stoke Newington. You're welcome to come and visit. And a transdisciplinary practice is kind of really like what's core to the studio. We have huge amounts of people from very diverse backgrounds coming and working with us. But what I want to kind of whiz through is some of the projects that we've been doing for the past, I think it's like 14 years now, which I might suddenly feel very old, but for quite, quite a while, um, I've basically been sort of really looking at this notion of change and transformation and how design can be an agent, an agent of change. So I've got five core examples um, of participatory design projects that we've been doing um, in the city, um, all over the world, that look at shelter, food, <laughs> energy, water and health. This is just a short, short video of a project that we did last year for Nike. It just kind of symbolises to me about the power of design, changing materials, playing with language, smashing conventions. And this is a project that was based on wabi-sabi, which is a Japanese Buddhist philosophy which celebrates imperfection, impermanence, and things which are incomplete. And these are qualities which I really strive for and look for in design. So this was a project that was in their gallery, and we made 200 terracotta basketballs. People could shoot this one precious shot into the hoop, and it would smash to smithereens. You know, some got it in, some didn't, and then, you know, it took like three seconds to smash this ball, and then people would stay up to three to four hours just gluing this ball back together, and it was this beautiful process. The, the act of making and the act of mending and the act of, of repairing is such a powerful tool for bringing communities and bringing people together. It's a very positive transformative action. Making and doing stuff with your hands and with your body uh, has really been central to my own um, practice as an artist. We're mostly known for, I would say, it's a very large-scale um, ephemeral architecture that we've been developing and a lot of it is inspired by collaborating with scientists, um, looking at biological systems, uh, working with nanoscientists. And I'll show you some of those um, projects. But they're all basically looking at public space and looking at how designers can intervene in public space and transform. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is really create playgrounds for collective dreaming and really looking at storytelling and imagination and inspiring communities to live in a much more sort of light-footed way on this planet. So all of our projects are really rooted in ideas around sustainability and, um, and collaborative working together in the city. And these are just some images of some of the great people that we get to work with. Actors, we work with scientists from all different fields, geneticists, sociologists, chemists, there's lots of designers and engineers, we work with chefs. And we put, every time we get a project or a commission, um, we just have this amazing group of people that will come and collaborate and work with us in the studio. A lot of my work previous to starting um, Loop was really focused on, as a designer, studying life and having a biomimetic um, investigation into life. So this was, um, uh, yeah, in 2000. Um, and it was when sort of um, people were first becoming interested in biomimicry. Um, so using, looking, looking, to, looking to, uh, to life and biology um, and looking at ways we can mimic, mimic them and engineer them. So we've done all sorts of projects around living structures, working with microalgae, bioluminescent light bulbs. So this has been a long, long thread throughout what we're doing. But what I find more relevant right now is um, how you can shift from um, biomimicry, where you're sort of mimicking discrete components and performances within biology, but moving into um, eco-mimicry. So look, looking much more at systems, looking at how they relate, uh, and uh, yeah, some of the qualities from ecologies that I find really inspiring for my design practice are ideas around adaptiveness, abundance, diversity, emergence, things which are seeded and transforming, resilient, successive. And I find this yeah, particularly exciting because a lot of understanding of the design world is, is things which are very planned and predetermined and things which are fixed. So I've just got a few examples of, of how I find designers really important in terms of working within the urban, urban realm. I think it's got, become quite obvious now that our systems of production and consumption are completely broken, and um, designers play a huge role within that, and they obviously um, shape the way in which we experience the world around us and basically transform, and they're the creators of all this stuff. So I think designers have a very, very important role to play. As I start to understand ideas around ecology, I've been reading about gateway species, and I find that designers or creatives, we can, be, we can broaden this up, um, are people who can really help shape the way in which we experience the world around us. Um, so I've been looking at sort of ecological succession um, and how um, 
uh, as an ecology would start to take ground. Um, there, there are gateway species like uh, mycelia and mushrooms which would make, make the ground much more fertile. Um, and I think that's a role that, that we can be playing in terms of planting ideas in people's imagination and then letting them grow, so seeding this idea. So this is an approach that we take when we're really doing our sort of placemaking um, ideas. Future makers really having a, a conscious role in helping to shape the future and to see the future as something which is plural and tangential and operating on, on many levels and not just this kind of one sort of linear, linear path. Um, so how can we develop multiple futures and shift our trajectory? Some of the ways we've been doing that is we work with community groups. We also work with businesses. This was in Bissons with Swarovski, the crystal company, and we made them all wear these silly glasses and walk around and imagine the world in these different years. Um, but we have a whole bunch of, um, of collaborative tools that we've developed over the years for working with groups of people. Um, they're design tools that allow people to collaborate and cooperate in a positive, in a much more sort of positive way. So I guess we're really looking at how design fiction and speculation leads to um, experimentation, action, and fundamentally change. And I think design plays a huge role in activation. So I'm excited about some of the projects that we get to work on where we kind of go into a public space and we activate it through a workshop uh, or an installation or some possible, possible future. Where I position our place in, in terms of the design spectrum is very much where design fiction meets design activism. I think it's great to speculate, but I also think it's great to sort of go in and get messy and experiment uh, and work in real places. And this is when we were invited to um, a place called Vixa in Russia, which was quite a few years ago. Not very many people have visited this place, and it has a, a, lot, a, yeah, a lot of issues, and we were asked to go in and do this workshop. Um, and it was a collaborative process. Um, we ended up... Um, it's a community-led process, and the, the group came up with this idea of planting the words happiness in this area where there'd been a lot of crime. And basically, it was planted on this roof, and the greenery that was wild on this building just grew into it, so this kind of flourished, this kind of green piece. Storytellers, I think designers, artists play a huge role in telling stories. Our ability to tell stories is what makes us human and could be said to set us apart from other species. Um, I think it's um, everything in our life is based upon uh, stories, whether it's religion or, or who's in, in power. Um, and I think it's like an incredibly powerful, powerful tool. We've been using storytelling and getting more involved with films and design probes. This is a music video for Architecture in Helsinki, an Australian band. And we just use this as an opportunity to really explore some really interesting ideas like what happens when home fabrication meets DIY biotech. Yeah, this was a couple of years ago now when we made this. Um, but it really got me interested in this idea of creating um, films and scenography and how you could use that as a, as a, as a language, a spatial language, to invite people in, into these spaces. So since then, I've really sort of been looking at all the installations that we've been making in public space. Um, it's a scenography. It's almost like a film set. People can come in and it's telling a particular narrative through uh, the texturing of the atmosphere or through the lighting. And this is a project called Osmo that was in Canning Town, um, it was a very difficult brief. We were asked to create this spectacular light installation with about £20 under this Canning Town flyover. And I think when we sort of moved in there, we had to literally like scrape away all the needles and the human feces. It was like a terrible, terrible space. Um, but when we had two weeks to do it as well, but it's actually become one of the most sort of interesting projects for me, actually, because it was like very quick brief, no budget, really quick turnaround. And the idea was that we, um, we would recreate the night sky um, under this bridge. So we used mylar silver aluminium foil and we hand etched over 9,000 stars into this um, membrane, glued it all together, sellotaped it together. So it's this huge, crinkly, giant crisp packet. And then what we found was that this aluminium foil blocked EMF signals, so it became like this huge Faraday cage. So it just became this bubble, this kind of restorative bubble, and people were able to step into it. A lot of our work's been incredibly high tech. We used a lot of technology and electronics that break, whereas this was great because it was just a big crisp packet but it had a great, great impact. And this was when it was shown in Vancouver at TED, at the TED Global event. So this became a sort of chill out space for the speakers to come and hang out and have a different kind of conversation. But ultimately this is based on the fact that we can no longer see the night sky in our cities because of, of, of all the air pollution and smog. So it's like, how do we recreate that feeling of sitting and discussing under the stars 
your technology doesn't work, your phones don't work. And it's kind of constantly breathing as it inflates and deflates. And this thing just packs down to a sort of small suitcase. You can fly around with it, inflate it in various places. <laughs> One of the things that I've been sort of trying to look at, look at my practice is how can we be abundant scouts? There's a lot of talk about scarcity, and it's just one of those stories that we're told, and there's a lot of ideas around, um, well, perceived scarcity. And I'm just wondering how we can use um, uh, this kind of storytelling to shift that around and find the abundances. Um, so I've just got a, f a few projects here which look at shelter, food, energy, water, and health, and how we can find those abundances within the city. So shelter... This is a project that was in Amsterdam. It's a huge nine metre tall floating piece of ephemeral architecture based on how mangrove grow. We've been collaborating with um, scientists from carbon, uh, carbon nanoscience to look at structures found on a, on a nano scale and how we can implement on them on an architectural scale. So we've been working with a lot of structural, structural engineers. So a lot of our work is actually quite technical and we're working with engineers and architects from all over. And it's one of the things that we really value in the studio is lightness. I think this is a great quality, design quality. And if we're looking at ideas around sustainability, it's really important. If, in terms of looking at lightness, how does nature build? How do plants grow? What's the structure of bones? You know, lightness is always a quality that one looks for. So I really like this periodic table of elements that's been reordered by Niels Bohr in the order of weight with the very lightest elements at the top. And if you look at how... Um, how biology builds. Most, most of our natural systems are just built from the top two substats. So lightness is super important. And I'm often telling people how much our structures and things weigh when all they want to know is how much do they cost. So we've been developing this technique and we call it Archilace. My background's actually in textile design. So I've been doing a lot of printing and lace making. So I've been studying lace with the Lace Guild. And then I've been looking at how you can take lace making, combine it with um, carbon nanoscience, combine it with advanced... Um, fibres and how can you create architecture based on this lace making technique. So we've been building these huge structures based on carbon bonds. So I actually get to travel the world to all sorts of architecture schools now, um, teaching this archilace technique to architecture students, which is great. So I turn up with this bunch of spaghetti sticks. And this particular workshop was really interesting because it was about taking a few rules. And so it's looking at how people cooperate. And they weren't really allowed to talk. So one person would be focused on like buttressing. Another person would be focused on just like growth. And so each person had a different role. So this was a structure which completely emerged within the workshop. So yeah, we take the circle as a building block and interweave them. And it's based on a, a geometric principle of looking at the qualities of like five, six, and seven, and how they interrelate, and how you can make these dodecahedrons and hyperbolic space, and then you can basically build anything with this technique. This was the, the Sol Dome, which was in Michigan quite a few years ago now. It's one of the first bigger pieces that we built with the technique. And actually, I just love going to different parts of the world and teaching people how to do this. So it's all about, the, it's built collaboratively by the people wherever we're going in the space. They know how to repair it then. So this piece was actually built with four volunteers, and it was, they built it in like five hours or something, based on this sort of repetition. It also had an array of solar cells in the bottom, which then correlated to this light show at night. And then all of these structures, well, a lot of them are designed in 3D in Grasshopper using like parametric design software. So we have a lot of design tools now for growing these things. This is the showing you the piece in Amsterdam. And technically this was really challenging because it was floating, floating on the water and it was um, nine meters tall. Nine metres is very tall, isn't that yeah. It's very tall when you're building this thing by hand. It's probably the scariest um, thing that I've ever worked on. It was at Christmas as well, so we were by, by the river, just freezing, the canal actually freezing. I cried every day, it's actually quite horrible. <laughs> but there's uh, nice pictures and pretty music, so you can forget about that. <laughs> we're now growing these structures in software, and we're looking at how we can take sensor data to grow these things, and how we can apply them to different urban sites. What kind of sensor data can we take from a site, whether it's UV, wind, and then actually grow these structures? So this is some of the um, more uh, speculative um, architectural ideas that we're working on. The other thing I want to talk about is food. It's quite important. We're all shifting to the city. There's huge amounts of people living in the cities, and our cities are incredibly hungry and not necessarily part of a great food system. 
I think there's some really, really scary statistics of, um, which say that London would be like literally starving in like, um, like five or six days if, the, if our supply was cut off. So um, I'm just really interested in like how we can look at opportunities for growing food in the city. I think this was like in 2008 when, when I was working on this and it was funded by Audi, the Design Foundation. It was called Metabolicity. But essentially, it was looking at the ideas around metabolism and how you could look at the city as a metabolic system. And I was actually really excited about some of the techniques and technologies that NASA have been developing for their spacecraft so that they can grow food in space. I'm like, whoa, let's grow food in our cities first, shall we? How can you take some of that technology and bring it into schools, community centres, housing estates, and really test it in places which have like very little greenery, it's all concreted over. If there's any soil, it's highly polluted. So we took this technology, aeroponics, which, was, which is a way of growing food in like a, a nutrient mist solution, so it's soilless growing and incredibly lightweight because we like lightness. And we worked with like, yeah, community centres. This is in St. Luke's. We, bought, we built this huge green wall using this archilace technique. And here are some lovely tomatoes that we grew. This project as a designer was like, fascinating because we set up a whole um, website so that all these different community groups that we were working with um, could actually communicate and share their tips and get together and share their produce. And you know, if there was a surplus on one site, they could share it with another. And a lot of these growing sites are still, are still going, even though it's 2008. Oh, these are a long time ago. Energy. I had the great opportunity to work with Sir John Walker, who won a Nobel Prize in 97 for discovering the rotary mechanism of ATP synthase, which was the first ever biological machine. And it's just an incredible process, and it's responsible for everything from respiration, photosynthesis, everything that keeps life going from plant, everything from plants, humans, on a cellular level. And it's just an incredible discovery. It's basically everything to do with, um, with metabolism. Um, and John really explained to me how energy works chemically in living systems and in the body. And the project really was to work with a scientist. Uh, it was to ask a designer, an artist, to work with a scientist to visualise their work. Uh, and actually, when we first started working together, he was really actually looking for someone who would make some new curtains for his lab. I'm not even joking. Um, and he, he quite liked a new tie. Uh, and I was like, whoa, 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 I'm not really that kind of textile designer. I would, probably would say yes now. Um, but it was really interesting to work with him over this two-year period, really int interesting, difficult conversations. Uh, we've continued to work with his department to look at how you can um, use making and like an embodied experience of stuff and holding stuff to understand things which are quite abstract. So you can see the model there in the corner. That's normally how scientists in his department are working. We were looking at how we could um, use some of these um, building lace techniques to sort of understand um, molecular, molecular biology and how they interact and move. And so from that collaboration, we um, developed a, a workshop which is called Solar Jam. And this is somewhere in Germany, I can't remember now. And we worked with chefs, scientists, textile designers um, within this workshop to look at the energy potential of berries. So basically, people were making their own sol solar cells. We took berries, they extracted the dye, and they would make their own working solar cells. Uh, they're quite, it's a technique called dye-sensitized solar cells. And with those, that same dye, we were like dyeing textiles and we were making stuff that we could eat as well. So it's just really looking at these um, similarities and commonalities and all these different practices. There's another project we worked on um, in 2012 called Energy Futures, and this was funded by EDF. And we were looking at how we could transform a park in Lille into this new energy orchard of the future. We were sort of doing some research and asking around and going into labs and figuring out what's, what's being developed inside laboratories in terms to do with um, energy. So we were looking at ideas around bioluminescence and how you could start to bioengineer trees that could glow, and how you could develop light forms that would glow to replace street lighting. So quite kind of far out ideas in terms of like how they could be implemented within this park. Looking, yeah, how we could augment it and ideas around artificial carbon capture. So we took these small science stories and blew them up into these sort of bigger scale pieces. This was a lab that we built that ran workshops but I think, yeah, we had like hundreds and hundreds of school children in Lille kind of come and, and work with different scientists there looking at energy. We did a lot of work looking at the notion of biofacades and working with them um, with algae, kind of, uh, yeah, microgreen algae, which uh, at the time people were interested in how you could burn it and use it as a biofuel, um, which I think is actually quite stupid now because you should probably just eat it. So we've been doing some work now on, on how you can grow different strains of algae. And again, this was like looking at how you could use the language of the familiar. So these are very sort of lacy neck curtains, which actually have algae pumping through them and photosynthesizing. 
This next project is called the Horticultural Spa. And this was looking at water and the ideas around water scarcity. This was um, a project we were commissioned by the Nine Elms Vauxhall Partnership. And I wanted to uh, basically develop a different kind of bathhouse, a different kind of public experience where you're just using uh, a very minimal amount of water. So we, we used a technology that's used in agriculture to keep, keep produce and plants fresh. So you basically recreate a, a cloud. So you, it produces the tiniest, tiniest droplets. It's this kind of water vapour fog. And it's nice, this idea that you enter this space, this inflated bubble, and there's all kind of um, medicinal plants growing in there, and, we, and you've got essential oils that are in the mist, um, and it's a collective experience. And it was really there for the people who are incred incredibly disrupted by all the development and gentrification that's going on in that area. And it just became a really interesting social space. The people who were living in the, in the blocks nearby would come quite regularly. We were there for, for like two weeks. And we had like different meditation facilitators, yoga teachers come, and we used to run sessions in the fog, meditation in the fog. And it was just this time I got really interested in this idea of like restorative placemaking. How can you bring these restorative um, types of environments into spaces which communities really need it? And we were able to sort of facilitate discussions, not act upon anything, I would say. We're focusing most of our studio's work now in this area. It became like a futuristic tea ceremony. It's also at this point that we've really started working with them, um, with different types of experts within our team. So we work with actors now, um, so that these installations they become more facilitated happenings or experiences. So we have actors and we have people who have been teaching meditation for for, for many years. You can really sort of facilitate these spaces, whereas before I think the work was sort of much more um, kind of sculptural, I guess. This is a project called Velo 2, and this was in, in Taipei. And um, we were commissioned by a, a um, life insurance company. They wanted us to create a giant Chinese lantern that lit up. I was like, oh, it's a bit boring. So we, we did some workshopping with, um, with this company when we went over there. And we kind of really looked at some urban issues that, that, that they had, that were facing in Taipei. And we looked at how light could be used as a communicator, how you could use light to, to communicate something which is happening that is, is perhaps unseen. So we were looking at a lot of ideas and is, issues around air pollution. So we ended up getting a, quite an advanced um, air quality sensor installed over there by the installation. And I also got really excited about this idea of like an installation that you really activate with your body, almost like sculptures that you can ride on and activate with and move. They're just like super cute kids. So this installation like, was um, uh, open for like, yeah, people of all ages, so there'd be a like, lot, of, lot of kids, and then as it got later at night, uh, kind of teenagers would come in. So it was basically a pump track, and it was kind of based on this. The whole light system was based on like, a, this idea of this pair of lungs, which is breathing. And we were able to measure all the different sort of particulates and pollutants and, and display it through this light system, which was a kind of breathing installation. I think I've got a short video here. good air quality because <laughs> it's at night nobody's driving around. and what's good about this project is that um, we were then invited to um, present the project to the uh, Department of Transport at the government and the Department for um, uh, the Environment and they, um, we've been looking at ways to sort of roll out and digitise their their um, communication system for air quality because at the moment when the air, the air quality gets really bad schools just would like wave a red flag and that means you can't go to school you have to turn back so um yeah we're trying to improve that <laughs> and then this last this last project is something that we're, we're we've been doing regular installations of it it was a, it started off being in singapore last year and, we did, and it was just at manchester Science Festival last year, where I think we had about two and a half thousand people experience it. It was called the Crenarium. 
and it was basically an experiment in looking at the kind of environment you can create to aid relaxation and sleep. But basically, it's this sort of closed-off booth where we're uh, controlling the light levels, and we're looking at the uh, physiological effects of light on the body and the colour spectrum that you go through. And we've also worked with an incredible composer to develop a soundscape, which also looks at brain entrainment that shifts your brain into these different states. So by the end of this 20-minute journey of your hanging in these hammocks, which are quite kind of womb-like, you're relaxed and sometimes people are asleep. We're really looking at sort of um, all the issues around sleep in the city and how we can create these sort of shared public experiences that, that sort of tackle this. We sleep less and less and less as the decades go by with our use of technology. So I guess we're looking at how technology could be used to, um, to address that. And I'm now going to be running regular sessions of these in my studio if anyone's interested to come and experience it. So there's just a few examples of, of um, where we've been trying to uh, use design in a transformative way in public spaces. Welcome to the Cronarium Sleep Lab. That's my yoga teacher. <laughs> I can't go to his classes anymore. Once you've sat back, we need you to lie back so that your back and your head and neck are completely supported. And immerse yourself completely in the surrounding light and sound. basically goes through a colour spectrum and then you're just in pitch black, you're just in complete darkness. And uh, when we did it in Manchester, it was in, actually in the Arndale Shopping Centre, um, which is just this yeah, a huge commercial space. Um, and yeah, I think it's really interesting to go into these spaces that need this restorative element. Thank you.